Protecting Democracy for November 3rd, 2020 and Beyond. I'm Jason Jaffrey, Chief Development Officer at Campaign Legal Center. Thank you all for joining us. CLC is a national nonpartisan organization that works to advance democracy through law at the federal, state, and local levels. We fight for every American's right to participate in the democratic process. We believe our democracy should be transparent, accountable, and inclusive. Voting in 2020 will be different from that uh, any other election. Today, CLC experts and special guests from the League of Women Voters and the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice will discuss successful and active legal fights around some of the most important voting issues this year. In addition to discussing voting rights and legal battles, later in today's discussion, the panel will review possible election results scenarios to help us all prepare for an unprecedented election day starting with the possibility of not having the results of the election on election night. Before I introduce today's panel, I would like to review a few housekeeping items for this afternoon's discussion. First, please use the comments section on Facebook or YouTube to submit your questions for members of the panel. After we have heard from our panel, we will start the question and answer portion of today's event. We will do our best to get to each question, but in the interest of time, we may not be able to answer every question. If we are not able to answer your question today and you are a member of the press, please email your questions to media at campaignlegal.org. If you're a member of the public and we're not able to get to your question today, please email info at campaignlegal.org. Now I would like to introduce today's panel. First, I would like to welcome Selena Stewart, Chief Counsel and Senior Director of Advocacy and Litigation at the League of Women Voters, where she develops and implements league political strategies and policy positions around election reform and voting rights issues. Danielle Lang is CLC's co-director of Voting Rights and Restoration, where she litigates a wide range of voting rights and redistricting matters before federal courts from the district court to the Supreme Court. Our next guest, Ryan Haygood, is president and CEO of the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice and is one of the nation's leading civil rights lawyers. The final member of our panel is Trevor Potter, CLC's president, former commissioner and chair of the Federal Election Commission appointed to a Republican seat by the first President Bush. Thank you to the members of the panel for joining us today for what I'm sure will be a very interesting conversation. So let's jump right in. Danielle, uh, I would like to start today off with one of the most covered voting rights cases over the past year, the battle over Amendment 4 in Florida. Celebrities like LeBron James and billionaire Michael Bloomberg donating and raising funds to help pay fines and fees for people with past felony convictions. Will you please tell us a little bit about how we got there and why celebrities have had to step up to help people pay to exercise their right to vote? Yes, um, I'm sure we'll talk about some bright spots in uh, voting rights litigation over this panel, but this will not be one of them. Um, it is uh, perhaps apt that in 2020, a year that is quite unexpected, um, we're facing an experience where folks are literally raising money to help other people be eligible to vote um, in a world where we thought we'd left that far behind. Um, but that's where we are. So in 2018, uh, Florida voters made a historic decision to re-enfranchise their neighbors, uh, people with past convictions that were living amongst them, um, as their neighbors and community members. Uh, they did so overwhelmingly and by, on a bipartisan level. Um, over 65% of Florida voters voted for rights restoration for people who had completed their sentence. But while voters um, believed in second chances for their community members, many politicians did not. Um, perhaps motivated by a view of how some of those individuals might vote and how they might change or shape an electorate uh, that politicians were happy with the status quo, uh, they passed a law that largely gutted Amendment 4 um, and did so by saying that you have to complete, that completing your sentence means paying every fine, fee, or piece of restitution that was attached to your felony conviction at the time you were convicted. And some of us who ha don't have a lot of experience with the criminal justice system might not know, but we have largely in America decided to fund our criminal justice system and our court system on the backs of criminal defendants. And that means that people with convictions, however minor, um, ordinarily leave the criminal justice system saddled with thousands of dollars of debt uh, that they certainly cannot pay and that the state knows that they cannot pay and don't, does not expect them to ever be able to pay. Uh, these are folks um, that were largely represented by public defenders because of their financial status. 
Um, and so while some folks are going to benefit from um, Amendment 4, hundreds of thousands of them, um, many more hundreds of thousands uh, will be blocked by the sheer fact that they still owe money to the state. And so this is where we found ourselves after an enormous victory against this law in the district court, a prior victory against this law in the circuit court. Finally, um, the state got its way by going to the en banc full 11th circuit um, and in a um, tight split um, along largely what you might call partisan divides, the 11th circuit upheld Florida's law. Um, and that's where we are today. Um, thanks to the generosity of folks um, across the country, famous and not famous, um, you know, donating small amounts and large amounts, um, and the hard work of the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition, some folks have had their fines and fees paid off by their neighbors so that they can uh, cast a vote this November. And that's really been heroic um, work. It shouldn't have been necessary, um, but it's important. I'll just add uh, two caveat, two kind of additional um, comments on the scenario in Florida. Uh, one is that uh, the state has kind of ironically and quite cynically turned around and said that the actions by folks um, who are trying to help up their neighbors become eligible to vote somehow might run afoul of the statutes against vote buying um, and suggested to the FBI in a very public letter uh, that folks be criminally investigated. Um, there is no violation of law here. Um, no one's vote is being purchased. No one has to vote at all if they want. It is the generosity of neighbors that is helping people become eligible. That shouldn't be necessary, but it is because of Florida's actions and they're turning around and, and suggesting that that generosity is somehow corrupt uh, is deeply cynical. Um, second, uh, CLC has been really happy to play a small um, uh, role in this work um, about uh, helping people with past convictions understand their eligibility and get their fines and fees paid off. And so through our Restore Your Vote program, we have been running text campaigns um, and social media campaigns uh, to help folks reach folks directly, make sure that folks who were eligible could get registered prior to the registration deadline, help those folks get their fines and fees paid off. And now for the folks who are registered, make sure that they understand whether or not they're actually eligible to cast a vote and get their fines and fees paid off before election day, if possible. Um, and through that work, uh, we identified yet another problem in Florida, which was the going down of the voter registration, online voter registration portal in Florida on the last day of voter registration. Um, we were working with people with convictions who had just gotten their fines and fees paid off. This was their last opportunity to register to vote and they could not access the system. And because of advocates kind of strong pushing um, and threats of litigation late on the night of Monday night, um, Florida did extend its voter registration deadline till 7 p.m. on Tuesday. Well, that really wasn't enough. Um, the impact was enormous and 40,000 more Florida voters were able to register to vote um, after CLC and other allies um, jumped into action to threaten litigation if the secretary didn't provide a fix. So that's where we are in Florida. We'll see what happens in the next couple of weeks. I, I expect it won't stay quiet. Thank you, Danielle. Um, Ryan, next question to you. Due to the coronavirus, we're expecting to see a tremendous increase in the number of absentee and vote by mail ballots this year. In the past, signature match policies and other technical issues have made it challenging to cast votes by mail in some states. Will you tell us a little bit about your work to improve the process? Sure, Jason, and uh, thank you uh, to you and your team, to Danielle, Selena, and Trevor to join this conversation with, with you all. I really appreciate it, and I'm humbled by it. I was listening to Danielle tell the story about trying to restore the right to vote um, to people with criminal convictions in Florida, and, and Danielle, the, the famous William Faulkner quote came to mind that the past is never dead. In fact, it's not even past, and I was thinking about how when I started as a, a lawyer, the, <clears throat> the Legal Defense Fund, it was a few years after Bush versus Gore, right, which is a case decided on the strength of fewer than 550 votes and out of Florida at a time when more than a million people could not vote there because of criminal convictions. And so 
I am so thankful that that fight continues. It needs to fight. It needs to continue. It's it's a it's a righteous fight. It's the right fight. It's a fight that we have taken on here in New Jersey. And I want to say a, a quick word about that to your point, Jason. We um, have really been sober minded about how difficult the national moment has been. We anticipated a 2016 when uh, the Shelby County decision tore the heart out of the Voting Rights Act. And folks know that Section 5 was our democracy's discrimination checkpoint. And after the Supreme Court struck it in 2013, folks know that the history was that states began very aggressively to enact all manner of efforts to suppress the right to vote. And that literally blazed a trail to the November uh, 2016 election and white supremacy restored to the White House. And this particular difficult moment was one we could have imagined following the election twice of a black president. I think if there's a theme to American democracy, it is that you cannot have the kind of progress we saw, the election of a black man to the highest office in the land, followed by the appointment of a black attorney general and a black woman attorney general with then, without then having a corresponding response to scale back democracy. I think that's the theme. Expansion of democracy always follows swiftly by efforts to scale it back. And we're in that moment now. And so to Danielle's point, inspired by, humbled by, sober-minded about the difficult national reality, we set out in New Jersey a couple of years ago to build an expansive democracy from the ground up. We knew that it would be a difficult fight to be sure at the federal level, but we were also clear about how when changes happen, it's always, always, always happened from the ground up in our communities. And so we began organizing people in New Jersey across the state around what would it look like to build one of the most expansive democracies in the country. So we began focusing on things like automatic voter registration, online voter registration, to Daniel's point, restoring voting rights for people in prison, on probation and parole, and ending the practice of prison-based gerrymandering, the practice right where you count people in prison even though they don't live in those communities. And when they leave, they'll return to other communities and they also can't vote in those communities. So we begin looking at those things and chipping away at those things and launching campaigns, one of which was around restoration of voting rights of people in, with criminal convictions. We launched a campaign uh, called 1844 No More. It was tied to the year 1844 in New Jersey uh, when the state restricted voting to white men only. Uh, New Jersey was the first Northern state to do that. That happened in 1844. That was the same year that New Jersey restricted voting for people with criminal convictions. And so this campaign 1844 No More was really designed to build a New Jersey that is in fact 1844 no more, where people can vote without regard to criminal convictions, including whether they were in prison. And so I will, so the long and short was a lot of uh, grassroots organizing, a lot of research and writing, a lot of advocacy, a lot of centering people with criminal convictions who could not vote in the effort, lifting their voices. One of my colleagues, Ron Pierce, who was deprived of his voting rights in New Jersey 30 years ago, talks about how voting has value to the soul, that it's an act that connects individuals back to whole communities. And if what we care about is connecting people with criminal convictions back to their communities, voting is a tool that research has shown does that. So the long and short is that after some really intense advocacy, uh, the Institute Legal Men Voters, a number of partners here in New Jersey, uh, were successful in championing a bill that restored the right to vote to 83,000 people on probation and parole. We did not yet reach people in prison, but we will as part of this campaign. And that's a number that's almost the size of our capital city of Trenton. And so in this upcoming election, uh, 83,000 people are now eligible to vote who previously could not vote going back to 1844. This coincides at the same time as online voter registration becoming active in the state, which is an important piece of this effort. Uh, since that bill became effective in early September, 300,000 people have registered to vote online. And so I lift these things up because yes, it's a difficult moment, but I think that part of what guides this work is the realization that 
we always affect change from the ground up in our communities and we're working very hard to do that. I wanna lift up two quick things in the litigation front. Um, it seems like a blur, Danielle, but I think it was less than a month or two ago that Danielle reached out to me and explained that uh, she had been doing a lot of work nationally around encouraging states to provide voters notice when their ballots were rejected for signature related issues. Um, and then giving those voters a chance to fix the signature issue. This was not something that New Jersey had. New Jersey rejected the votes of thousands of voters in every election pre-coronavirus, to your question, Jason, pre-coronavirus. And those voters were none the wiser. They were often voted thinking that their votes uh, were counted and ultimately thousands of them weren't. And black voters and Latino voters had their ballots rejected at a rate of about two to one versus white voters. So we were really, really um, honored and proud to partner with Danielle in a case that was filed against New Jersey to encourage New Jersey to provide these two things. Notice when their ballots, when voters' ballots are rejected as a result of signature related issues and then a chance to cure. And the state, after the case was filed, quickly began to enter into settlement agreement, a uh, settlement discussions with us, resulting in a settlement that became codified very quickly in state law. And in the July primary, almost 10,000 voters whose votes were rejected had a chance to cure those ballots. Really, really incredible, incredible work. The last thing I'll say quickly before I, I pause is that after, I think probably Danielle, right after the consent, right after the, um, the settlement became law, uh, Donald Trump's uh, campaign filed a lawsuit against New Jersey challenging an executive order from the governor of New Jersey, Governor Murphy, uh, that was that sent every voter uh, a ballot in the mail uh, and that allowed that for those ballots that arrived within two days after the election, even though they didn't have, didn't have a postmark to be counted. And the Trump campaign filed a challenge to this executive order, which obviously is occasioned in the coronavirus moment um, and it was, in, in my mind, a, a voter suppression effort by the Trump campaign to sow confusion and dissension, to undermine confidence in the, in the process. Again, we teamed up with, with Danielle and the legal and voters here in New Jersey and, uh, and it achieved an incredible result earlier this week where a federal district court judge rejected a preliminary injunction that they filed. So I think one of the themes I think that, that we glean from this particular moment is that the ballot is so precious because it's so transformative and because it's those things, it's always a hotly contested issue and it's worth the fight. And that's what this conversation is about. And I'm excited to be a part of it. Thank you, Noah. Thank you, Ryan. Ryan, um, Ryan I think that they just knew that we wanted to work together again. Ab listen, absolutely. Uh, I'm, looking, yeah, yeah, I'm looking forward to the next one. You know, I know you have several up your sleeve. Well, um, let, let's bring our other partner into the conversation, Selena. Um, access to the ballot is also key in protecting the integrity of the election. Are there any other pending decisions that you think will have a significant impact on voters before Election Day? Yeah, there are absolutely pending decisions and issues that will have a significant impact on voters. Two types of cases in particular that come to mind are ballot box availability, and also, as Ryan mentioned and teed up for me, thank you very much, Ryan, notice and cure options for voters. So in regards to ballot box availability, we've seen states like Texas and Pennsylvania fight in court to maintain ballot box um, availability. Just last week, Governor uh, Abbott in Texas announced restrictions on ballot boxes, which would have the effect of limiting ballot boxes to one per county. Now for any that put in Texas, Texas is humongous. They have a sign when you get to the airport that says everything is bigger in Texas, and it's true. And so when you think about in con that in context, um, we have counties and cities or cities like Houston, Dallas, and Austin, this would have been a tremendous barrier for voters and created a significant access issue. Um, and this same issue or similar issue is happening in Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania, where we're also in court fighting to ensure ballot boxes can be placed beyond county election offices. And that's really to ensure greater access and ease for voters. This is not uncommon. You know, many states have had ballot box drop or ballot drop boxes at libraries, grocery stores, and all types of common sense locations. And then I 
to touch on what Ryan mentioned, which is the notice and cure option for voters. Notice and cure provides really the most effective mitigating factor against voter suppression. Um, having a notice and cure process in place across the state allows voters to fix or cure their ballots when it's flagged for rejection. Data across the country shows that Black voters and communities of color experience rates of higher, higher rates of rejection for absentee ballots. And so it, it makes sense why Black voters are, are sometimes hesitant to use this as an option for voting. So I think that when voters have the opportunity to cure their ballots, and especially because this is gonna be a new process for millions of voters across the country. And so on this front, I think it instills confidence and trust in the systems for those voters who made it, they may, who know that they may be targets um, in this process. So we work with CLC a lot on this. Danielle is actually like our notice and cure guru <laughs> in many cases. And so she may have more to add on here, but I, but the last thing I just wanna point out here in this, in this context is that it was really important to appropriately respond with remedies that will make it easier for people to execute their ballots, especially knowing that in many states across the country, there's been double digit increases on the applications and the people who are trying to opt into this process. And then also understanding that this will be new for millions of voters. You know, there, there could be issues. And so we have an opportunity to execute their ballot and really make sure they are counted in this upcoming election. And I think it goes without saying that it's important to reiterate that mail-in balloting is safe and it's secure and it's a viable option for people, especially in a pandemic where people are concerned about having to choose between exercising their constitutional right and risking health and safety. And so I think that this is just a good option for as many people as possible who, who include this in their voting plan. And it's super important to make sure that we include this option in order to expand access and participation in this upcoming election. Jane, uh, you're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks folks, sorry about that. Um, uh, thank you so much, Selena, and uh, thanks for reminding me to unmute myself. Um, Trevor, we're going to turn to you now. Um, we talked a great deal about absentee and vote by mail ballots. How do you think the expected increase will affect uh, election night? Thanks so much, Jason. It's great to be here, uh, particularly with Selena and Ryan, and have a chance to talk about these issues. Uh, there's been a lot of misinformation. Uh, about absentee balloting and, and voting by mail. So let me just quickly uh, explain the terms we're using. Uh, we vote across this country in a variety of ways. That has changed somewhat this year because of the COVID pandemic. But we range from states that traditionally have only voted in person unless you had an excuse which was usually uh, you were uh, out of state and therefore unable to vote, or you were medically unable to vote, very narrow categories. So there are states that, that used to do that and have now moved to what they call no excuse absentee balloting, which means you don't need a reason to request an absentee ballot, you may do so. But there are others like Texas that have uh, stubbornly dug in and said, no, you absolutely have to have an excuse or you have to turn up in person. So you have excuse states, then you have no excuse states, which means far more people can request an absentee ballot. Then you have states that are used to having a lot of people vote absentee, and they have established what they call permanent absentee lists. So you can say, I always want to vote absentee, and once you've said that once, you are sent a ballot at home every time. Then you have a couple states that this year have said, we're going to send all registered voters a ballot at home. So it's the equivalent of a permanent absentee list for the whole state. And that's California is one that's done that. And then you have five states that always vote at home, which is to say they send all registered voters a ballot and the registered voters can fill it out and either return it by mail or return it in person or put it in a uh, government drop box. So we have this broad range 
And therefore, to talk about mail-in voting and absentee voting is confusing because absentee voters use the mails. President Trump votes by mail when he votes absentee in Florida. Uh, so does Vice President Pence and, and other people. This the distinction some people have drawn between requesting an absentee ballot and just getting a ballot in the mail, as I've explained, really depends on, on the state. Uh, the result of all of that is that some states are really well prepared for absentee voting because they do it all the time. Uh, the five states the, that routinely vote by mail uh, have had no troubles in previous elections, no evidence of fraud, and they're quick about it because voters know what they're doing. The system uh, counts ballots quickly. In many cases, those ballots are uh, opened and prepared for counting in advance. They're run through high-speed machines. And so the election night in Washington and Oregon is like election nights everywhere else, except they're counting ballots that arrived by mail rather than people who voted in person on machines in a voting place. At the other end of the spectrum, there are states, and one of them is Pennsylvania, another is New York, which traditionally have had pretty few absentee ballots, and they are slower in counting them, at least in the primaries when they came in, because they're counted by hand, they have to be cross-checked, and they don't start counting them until election day or election night. So you have a range across the country of states like Arizona and Florida, which will count huge numbers of absentee ballots quickly because they always have and they're used to it. And then we're gonna have states like Pennsylvania, which will be slower and counting after the election. So the issue here, first off, has been are absentee ballots secure? Uh, are they any different than regular in-person ballots? And the answer to that is they're just as secure because they have the same uh, voter uh, questions that have to be asked in order to ensure that the voter is entitled to cast a ballot. They are not sent to anyone living in the state just because they're there. They're only sent to registered voters. Those voters casting a vote by mail fill out the form, identify themselves. In some states, as we've discussed, they have to have a signature. Other states, they have um, some other identifying information like the last four of your social security. They have a barcode on them so that they are the equivalent of voting in person in terms of security and making certain the voter is a registered voter and therefore entitled to vote. Then we have the counting question. Uh, and what we're going to see on election night is some states are going to post their mail-in uh, returns at the same time as they're in person, or they may only have mail-in like the, the states I mentioned. But others are going to post their in-person totals coming off the voting machines that day, and then we'll begin to announce the absentee votes as they are counted uh, by hand, and therefore taking a while to do so. The key there will be understanding and having the press understand which position the state is in. When Florida reports its returns, how many ballots are outstanding? Florida is a good example because even though they count quickly, they allow, as do other states, votes to be counted if they were mailed by election day. And that means they will be coming in after election day. They're still legitimate, valid votes under the state's laws. They were cast on or before November 3rd, but they may not arrive for a couple days. So if we're looking at Florida, you want to know not only what is the vote total with all the absentees they have in hand, but how close is it and how many absentee ballots do they think they are? Florida has a large number of military uh, voters who are overseas and vote by mail, and it has citizens who live overseas and vote by mail. And so traditionally, there is some number of Florida votes that come in after the election and are perfectly legitimate. Uh, in 2000, those votes made a difference because it was so close. So you'll want to know on election night, how close is the state, how many votes are out, Go to the other end of the spectrum, a state like Pennsylvania, where we expect a large number of votes will be absentee. 
and the results we have the morning afterwards uh, will be very incomplete. So the question of how incomplete are they depends on how many absentee votes are sitting there to be counted, which is a process they will be going over through election week, not just election day. So I hope that's helpful in putting all of that in context. It really is, Trevor, thanks so much. Um, Danielle, we're gonna go back to you for the next question. Considering that we may not know the results of the election on election night that Trevor just described, are there any election night scenarios that we should be preparing for? Yeah, I, so I think that uh, Trevor did a really good job of kind of previewing the answer uh, to the question, I think. Um, but let me run through some options. Um, first, to, to kind of summarize what Trevor was explaining in detail about how the different counting of ballots works, we never know all of the election results on election night. We never do. Um, we never have. Um, there's always absentee ballots that need to be counted after election day. Um, there are notice and cure processes that go on to figure out if certain ballots are going to count or not count, depending on whether or not a voter fixes their ballot, etc. cetera. Um, so it's never the case that election results are final on election day. The question is just a matter of volume and whether or not um, it make, it'll make a difference to the outcome. Um, so the kind of calling of elections that we see on election day is a media event. It is not an official government event. And that happens uh, after ballots are can canvassed and certified, which usually happens at least a week, if not further out from the election. And then electors go, there is a whole process for the electoral college and whatnot. Um, so until the election results are canvassed well after election day, the election results aren't final. So there's a media event that happens on election night, which is kind of forecasting what are the likely outcomes based on the information we know. Um, and so uh, the questions about what's gonna happen on election night, it, these are options that are always on the table, right? Um, and we're in 2000, for example, when we did not know the result on election night. The question is just the likelihood of a scenario where we don't have a good sense of who won the election on election night. The chance of that is much higher this year because of the higher volume of ballots that will need to be counted after election day. Um, so all of the scenarios are kind of the same uh, as far as possibilities go, it's just the likelihoods are different. Um, so one possibility is that election night looks awfully like um, it usually does, where the media is able to forecast with some certainty uh, what the outcomes are likely to be and does so in a responsible and appropriate manner. Um, so you could imagine that if certain, if there are lands, if there's a landslide election, um, especially in states that um, don't have as much absentee voting or, or count before election day, um, you may see a, like a reasonably strong forecast um, of election results on election day. That's not all that likely um, given uh, all the circumstances that Trevor laid out. Um, so then the question is what happens um, when we don't know? Um, and I think that's where we all have a role to play. Um, Americans have a role in understanding the process and understanding that they need to wait and hear what the final vote, let the process play out, let every ballot be counted and find out what the answer is at the end. The media has a really important um, role to play in not jumping the gun on um, their forecasts, on um, being really clear about what the results that are being currently reported mean. Um, and what, what number of ballots are expected to be um, cast uh, that have not yet been counted. Um, and then uh, advocates uh, like ourselves all have a role in trying to do public education around that. Um, and then unfortunately we have a bit of a wild card which is how are the candidates going to react and how will the parties react? Um, and I think that that's where there, there is some concern. Um, there is concern that um, parties and candidates could try to delegitimate um, 
tried to say that only the election results that we know on election night are legitimate and try to delegitimize um, the counting as it continues after election night. Um, and that is something that we have to be kind of steadfast against. Um, and that could be setting the stage for all sorts of, you know, worst case scenario election shenanigans um, by kind of trying to delegitimize the popular vote um, that we're seeing in each state. Um, and so that's something we're keeping, you know, an eye out for. But I think that this is um, this is within the power of the American people um, and, and the media and others who shape the narrative um, to not buy in to any attempt to kind of undermine um, the results simply because it takes time to count the ballots. Um, you know, I will say that it's it's been an ironic thing to be working on the New Jersey litigation with Ryan because the Trump campaign there has been arguing that you cannot possibly even start canvassing the res the absentee ballots until before election day. While at the same time, we have a candidate, Trump, who has been suggesting that election night results are what matter. Um, so you have kind of a coordinated scenario where they're trying to make it impossible for vote by mail ballots to have been um, to have been properly counted by election day and then claim that anything that comes in after election day as far as results is illegitimate. Um, but I think that this is, you know, that narrative um, might exist on election night, but it's within the power of the American people to reject it. Great, thank you so much, Danielle. Um, we're going to begin our question and answer session now. So. Uh, as a reminder, if you have a question for a member of the panel, please submit it in the comments section on Facebook or YouTube. So our first audience question um, comes from Elena Abramson uh, to the entire panel. Have you noticed that judges appointed by President Trump are repeatedly ruling against expanded access? And second, have you noticed any trends arising from decisions in election related litigation, particularly in swing states. I'm happy to take that one, um, but I'm also happy to hear from um, my colleagues. Uh, so it is an unfortunate fact um, that conservative judges on the bench have been um, ruling against expanded access to voting. Now that is not new in the Trump era. Um, and uh, while it continues to be true in the Trump era, it is, it is not a new phenomenon. You know, in 2013, we lost um, the Voting Rights Act because the conservative majority in the Supreme Court gutted the Voting Rights Act and an important part of the Voting Rights Act. So um, there has been an unfortunate trend towards conservative judges repeatedly ruling in a manner that does not accord the right to vote, the um, respect and constitutional scrutiny that we believe it deserves. I'm not sure that that's new, although of course um, there are more conservative judges on the bench um, in federal court these days than there was uh, four years ago or three years ago. Um, and so in that way, um, there has been an increase. Um, uh, I do not think that I have noticed particular trends in swing states at this point, um, except for the volume of election of litigation, uh, so I'm not sure that I've seen any trends in the decisions that are coming out. Um, but I have certainly seen the trends in the number of cases. I mean, the number of cases that are ongoing in Pennsylvania is outrageous. Uh, it's impossible to keep track of, um, and I can only imagine that they are going to proliferate. Um, uh, as we get closer and closer to the election. Um, so I think that uh, what we see in, in um, swing states is just kind of um, a hotbed of, uh, of disputes because folks know that that's where, um, where the presidential campaign might be decided. And so that's where a lot of the um, actors like the RNC and the DNC are focusing their energies. Daniel, if I could just throw in there if you want to comment or others, uh, the, certainly in the 11th Circuit, uh, the the balance of the circuit was held by new Trump appointees. Uh, in fact, CLC had filed a motion urging that uh, three judges recuse themselves on the basis that they had had 
involvement with the very issue before them, uh, you know, query whether it was the very case that was part of the discussion, but CLC felt strongly uh, that they had uh, been involved in in this issue and therefore should recuse themselves. They did not, and uh, one did, two did not, and the two who did not uh, voted uh, in the majority to uh, prevent the Florida citizens uh, from voting. So I think there, at least, we, we have seen a very direct effect of, of new judges on the courts. That's absolutely true. They made the difference um, in that case. And um, you know, CLC does not file recusal motions lightly. It is the only one that we filed, I think, um, in the voting rights space during my five years here at CLC. Um, and we took it quite seriously, but these were judges that had already opined on the Florida law in their um, role on the Florida Supreme Court. Um, and in our view, uh, just weren't, weren't appropriate arbiters of the decision. And I just want to, you know, if there is a bright spot in this, I'm, you know, I'm trying to find the rainbow in the cloud, right? <laughs> but if that, if it is to be said, you know, the last three, three or four years, however, the precedent, the rulings that have come out, what I think has been important for us, you know, the league is litigating nearly in every, it feels like every state in the country um, to expand access. But one of the good things is, is that there is this thing called precedent. And that's the history of rulings that courts put down that goes well beyond modern, you know, the last three or four years. And I think that that has been helpful to us in many cases around the country. And the other thing is that, you know, the traditional, the traditional voting suppression that we've seen, you know, just has a new costume in many ways in this in this current environment. And I, we've noticed that not only are black voters, which, you know, who have been historically targeted in this country, but also Latinx voters and then reservations, Native American communities are really being targeted in this upcoming election cycle. Folks who live on reservations have limited access to mail-in ballot systems that are effective, um, use, use community um, structures to vote, like collecting all their ballots on the reservation and delivering them to an election official. All of those things are being challenged, but I think if there is a bright spot, it's just that we have rulings beyond this administration that have been helpful to us and has helped us get a little further in this fight, I think. I'll, um, I'll add a bright spot, uh, which is not to say it's all bright spots, right? Um, I, I would be remiss if I did not mention that um, the Supreme Court yet again decided to step in and um, substitute its judgment for the judgment of courts below it that had actually been closer to the facts in deciding to reinstate a witness requirement on absentee ballots, um, even though voting is already underway um, in South Carolina. Um, so it is not all bright spots. We are facing an uphill battle. Um, but with that said, I will add the bright spot that it does seem as though um, there is a stopping point to um, how far the courts will go. Um, and uh, the Trump campaign, I think, has has met it. Um, uh, while, uh, uh, unfortunately, um, especially the Supreme Court has not been particularly receptive to pro-voter positions in litigation, um, neither has it been the case that uh, the RNC is like most extreme, sorry, <laughs> puppy. <laughs> um, uh, but neither has it been the case that um, the Trump campaign's most extreme positions, like the one they took in New Jersey and have taken in Nevada and California and Montana, have not gotten traction. Um, so the kind of like affirmative work that the RNC is trying to do to set up new rules and kind of like the most um, conservative view of elections possible has not gotten traction. Um, so we can we can take some comfort in that. I mean, I would just add, I, I mean, I appreciate the, the bright spot uh, discussion because I do think, you know, we're in this moment, right? It's like both very painful, but it's also precious. And it's, I think it's precious in a, in the sense that there is what folks have described as sort of a, an awakening. You know, I think a couple of months ago, there was a concern about whether folks would be energized to participate in this election. And I don't, 
I don't, I've, I've not seen apathy. I've, I've seen folks who are really anxious to get access to the franchise and make that real and exercise their power in that way. And so one, you know, one of the questions in the chat is around whether you can trust the mail. We've been encouraging people to develop a plan right now for how they'll, they'll vote. And we, you know, we, we urge Governor Murphy to provide in-person voting opportunities. New Jersey's um, election will be an all paper ballot election, but those paper ballots can be cast by the mail, through Dropbox. There are also polling places where people can bring their, their, um, their ballots. So, you know, it's a very personal choice, but we urge Governor Murphy to make the in-person opportunity available because we heard from a lot of folks, particularly black voters who favor voting in person because they have distrust about casting their ballots in other ways. We've heard from other voters who are going to cast their ballot by mail and track the ballot. Either way in New Jersey, there's a way to track the ballot. We encourage folks to build in tracking as part of their, their bar, broad plan. And I think that's really got to be the message to our folks now that we've got to be clear about what the plan is today and then follow that plan through to the, to the end. Thank you all so much. Um, we're gonna turn to our next question in just a moment. Um, so again to the panel, do most states specify in their reported vote total if they include absentee ballots? And if so, do they usually note how many those are? I think the answer to that is yes, that they will give you the details of uh, obviously, like everything else in this area, it's complicated. They will give you the details of uh, the where the votes come from, that they're reporting, which precincts, et cetera. Uh, some states separate their absentee ballots from their in-person ballots and will report it as a separate category. Other states send the absentee ballots or ensure they are reported in part of the precinct totals. Uh, so you do have to look for it. But uh, in, in general, the states have the information of how many, you know, first, how many ballots were sent out. But of course, that's not helpful because many people will not return those ballots and will vote in person instead or will turn up, as, as Ryan was just discussing, and turn in a ballot. Um, but uh, that information should be obtainable looking carefully at the election results. And that data is really, really important. I know that it came up, um, it comes up in a lot of cases that we've had with CLC, but particularly in New York. Danielle, if you remember this, um, one of the reasons why we pushed back in New York is because we saw that, like, they had a 14% rejection rate um, in that state, which is high. <laughs> That's a lot of voters impacted. I think it was like 30,000 or so voters who were impacted by that. And so, that matters to know how many people's ballots were flagged for rejection and they did not, and some of these people didn't have the opportunity to fix it, didn't have the opportunity or have a notice and cure process in place to fix it. And so I think that that, that data is super important as we continue to think about where, where people are disenfranchised and what we do about it as organizations like the ones on the phone today. Yeah, and counties differ in how they report um, data as they go to some counties are reporting data kind of continually um, as they count. Um, so, you know, um, an ex election expert, uh, Michael McDonald, is doing all sorts of number crunching on early voting and the reports of rejection rates in North Carolina already. Um, so some of this data um, becomes available in a rolling fashion even before Election Day. Great, thank you, thank you all. Um, next question, what is the term Selena is using notice and care? Selena, can you explain that to the, to the audience? Yeah, absolutely, so it's notice and cure, and it's basically a process that allows a voter to fix, and what we're calling cure, fix their ballot if it's been flagged for rejection. So the most common reason I think for rejection usually comes down to something related to signature. So whether, you know, uh, election official thinks it looks different than what you've done in the past, or you forget to sign, sign the outer envelope or whatever the case may be, for whatever reason, election officials, when they're doing the tabulation, feel like, or canvassing doing the tabulation, that something is not right about the ballot, so it goes in a separate box. 
And so the notice and cure process allows that box now to be addressed and voters either get, depending, it varies across the country. Sometimes people get a postcard, some people get an email or a phone call from their local election official saying, hey, something's wrong with your ballot. Here's what we need in order to count you for this election. So hopefully that explains that. It does. Thanks so much. And it also reminds us that these conversations are useful both to inform our audience about uh, what they can expect around the election and also some of the some of the terms that we use in the work that we do. Um, we're going to move on to the next question now. Um, there are a lot of concerns about voter inti intimidation at the polls. So what should a voter do if they think they're encountering voter intimidation? So this is for the whole panel. This is tricky. I mean, there's federal laws that regulate this, right? Uh, that say that people have the right and should have the opportunity to execute their ballot in a peaceful manner, right? And so we have those laws, but the, the laws around brandishing and concealment sometimes in state. So what does it mean to, to brandish or create a threat um, in many states? And what does that mean for voters? I think, you know, I think this is a very personal decision. Uh, we have been talking to many leagues about de-escalation and how to effectively do that without endangering yourself and also not making a situation worse, you know, because it comes down to whether or not the person actually wants intervention and wants support and help. So it's a lot of factors, I think, that go into, go into this. But ultimately, I think we need to make sure that we create a safe, and secure environment for voters to execute their ballot. And so in, depending on the state that you're in and, and the laws around concealed weapons and also what brandishing means, all of that issues while people are voting. Yeah, so CLC has been giving a lot of thought um, as has the league um, on the issue of voter intimidation. Um, and I think it's important to know that um, it has been a tried and true tactic um, of some to kind of create fear about going to the polls, um, even when that fear is not um, actually backed up by um, any real meaningful threat. Um, so we wanna be careful not to kind of feed that narrative that folks should be afraid to go to the polls, that folks were saying this in 2016, how they were gonna send armies to the polls, et cetera. And our elections proceeded appropriately. Um, in large part, and that's because we have a, um, you know, a highly um, functional democracy and we have poll workers and officials and um, voters that are not going to stand for voter intimidation. So it's important for us not to scare voters away. Um, I think folks can feel safe going to their um, uh, voting locations. That being said, it's our job um, as advocates to um, think through all scenarios and make sure we're prepared for them. Um, and so what's important is for voters to know their rights, know that they have an absolute right to, they have a right to be there, they have a right not to be harassed, they have a right not to be intimidated, um, and they have as much a right to be there as anyone else, and they don't have to answer questions from, you know, uh, random folks. <laughs> um, they they can answer questions that come from poll officials. Um, and so there's kind of a sense of empowerment that we need to give to voters. Um, and there are really robust laws in most states that add on to the federal protections on voter intimidation. There are buffer zones, areas in which nobody can really be there unless they have some sort of designated official purpose. Um, and, and CLC has been doing research um, and preparing guides um, on voter intimidation laws. And what I've learned through that process is how much power poll officials have to um, maintain order um, in their polling locations and to remove folks who are being disorderly. Um, so the first line of offense is really to report the issues to the poll workers themselves. Um, there are ordinarily state hotlines as well where you can report to election officials for further investigation. You can always call the election protection hotline um, and that'll get in touch directly with voting rights lawyers who can um, you know, activate protections as well. Um, so the most important thing is to report issues. Um, if you are personally facing voter intimidation or, um, 
or with the permission of somebody else um, who wants something reported. Um, and, and there are a lot of protections in place and, and poll workers and officials and election officials have a lot of power um, to maintain um, you know, a, a free, a, a harassment free zone uh, for voters to vote in peace. I would just add to Danielle's point that we, uh, my, my colleague, Henel Patel, who leads our voting work, has been doing a bunch of work with a few elected officials to get a bill passed that uh, prohibits police officer presence in polling places to to reduce the threat of intimidation, particularly in this the George Floyd moment. Uh, and I think that adds, I think, to Danielle's point, poll workers are empowered to do a lot of things in the polling place, including to instill confidence. And very often that confidence is undermined when you walk in and see a police officer and not clear why a police officer would be in, in a polling place, uh, particularly now. Thanks so much. Um, we're, we're continuing to get some questions about absentee ballots. So uh, do you wanna transition back to that for a moment? Um, so the question is, isn't it unconstitutional to reject mail-in ballots for any reason without notice and opportunity to cure? Let me start with that, if I can, by saying that is certainly our belief. We have argued that successfully in court. Uh, Danielle can give us more information, but going back to Arizona in 2018, where we discovered that ballots uh, were being rejected because there were questions about the signature and they were not notifying voters, they were just throwing the votes out. And so we took the position there successfully, ultimately with a statewide court agreement that uh, voters would be given an opportunity to cure any questions about their ballot uh, in terms of their signature. Uh, different states have different rules on this. And so we have been in court and arguing around the country that voters should be given an opportunity to cure uh, defects. And particularly if the question is, did they vote the ballot? Is that really their vote? They should be able to say it was. Uh, one of the issues that's come up that I think is very unfortunate is in Pennsylvania, uh, where the state Supreme Court held that if a voter fails to use two envelopes in voting, if they just take their ballot, cast it, and then put it in the outer envelope that identifies who they are and uh, validates their identity, if they don't use a separate interior secrecy envelope, the Supreme Court said that those ballots will not be counted. Even though they're legitimate ballots, uh, even though the voter did everything they were supposed to do in proving their identity. So there are issues like that uh, that, that are uh, still in dispute. I don't know if anyone else wants to, to add to that. I'll just add um, that it's definitely the case that some things are, are much clearer cut than others in this area of law. Um, so I think issues around signatures um, are a prime example of something that requires notice and cure. Really anything that has to do with like an error on that outer envelope really should be something you can cure. Um, because at that point, um, it's just a question of like, was this ballot appropriately cast? Um, I think that the naked ballots, as they're calling it, issue um, in Pennsylvania is especially concerning, although I have enjoyed some of the um, uh, comedic uh, advocacy uh, that we've seen um, from uh, local advocates and politicians and celebrities um, around preventing naked ballots. If you haven't seen it, it's worth checking out. Um, but uh, the, is the bigger issue, um, uh, is uh, any errors that are on the ballot itself. Um, so if you uh, mark multiple, um, uh, if you you know mark multiple candidates when you're supposed to just pick one, or or other issues that are on the ballot itself, at that point, the um, in order to protect the secrecy of the ballot, the ballot itself um, has been separated from the voter. Um, and so at that point you might see ballots rejected. And so it's important to be careful in how you fill in the bubble, bubbles and things like that. Um, but certainly when it comes to kind of issues about um, the sending in of a mail-in ballot envelope and having that approved for counting, those are things we do believe require notice and cure. Thanks so much. We're gonna move on to our next question. 
Can you talk about whether you are all seeing a coordinated effort to restrict voting? Are you seeing consistent language in suits seeking to curtail mail-in voting, for instance? Yes. I mean, just on the second part of that question, um, it's an easy answer, which is that um, the uh, a number of the lawsuits that have been filed um, by the RNC campaign have large um, like pages and pages of copy and paste um, from one lawsuit to another. It's been an interesting experience to be on the other side of those and read the same allegations about uh, you know, fear mongering about vote by mail and um, security uh, with exactly the same paragraphs, um, whether they are suing in Montana or uh, New Jersey. And in fact, um, you know, uh, in in their loss in Montana, another case that we partnered with the League of Women Voters on, um, in their loss in Montana, the court kind of pointed to the fact that the lawsuit was it didn't really raise anything that was specific to Montana or the concerns of Montana. Instead, it had these just kind of blanket allegations that nas nationwide um, vote by mail was dangerous um, without actually grappling with the realities on the ground in Montana, a state that was already seeing extraordinarily high vote by mail rates well before um, the COVID-19 crisis. Um, and so, you know, yeah, we see this consistent language, but honestly, I think um, that kind of litigation um, that is cut and paste uh, has not seen a lot of success so far. And just to the first part of the question about whether we're seeing a coordinated effort to restrict voting, I feel like restricting voter suppression has always been coordinated. It, you know, it's nothing new you know, from poll taxes to literacy tests to voter purges that are happening now, it's always been a coordinated um, effort. And the reason why we know that is because like Danielle said, sometimes you see the exact same language, the exact same tactic used in different parts of the country, which tends to show that there is some coordination there. And so I just wanna point out that absolutely it's a coordinated effort to restrict voting. It is not novel. It's been happening for decades and centuries. And so it's really about identifying what costume is is the restriction coming in this time and how do we, you know, take off the costume and get to the core of what the issue is and, and you know, squash it. Thanks so much. Um, moving on to the next question. Um, the, the questioner asks, realistically, how long might it take a state like Pennsylvania to get most results and is there a cutoff? Uh, the, the first answer, go ahead, Danielle. Um, I'd actually be interested in hearing what you want to say, Trevor. I, I mean, the answer to is there a cutoff is certainly yes. Um, there's a series of deadlines that exist, um, a safe harbor deadline for um, allocating your electoral vote. Uh, your electoral votes for the Electoral College. There is the meeting of the Electoral College in mid-December. Um, and there is, I was trying to see if I could look it up fast. Uh, and Pennsylvania will have its own internal canvassing deadline that comes before those deadlines. Um, so the answer to is there a cutoff is most certainly yes. Um, we will get to an answer um, and we will get to it in orderly fashion, I believe. Um, but as far as the precise amount of time, I, I'd be interested in hearing if my colleagues have, have a guess. Um, I really don't know. Um, uh, and I'm not sure that Pennsylvania knows yet because um, this is gonna be their first go around in um, counting this many absentee ballots. Yeah, my comment was going to be that um, we need to remember that there are different scenarios here. Uh, one scenario is that Pennsylvania takes a long time. It just meets its electoral college deadlines. And no one is terrifically excited about that because the election has already been decided and Pennsylvania's votes are not key. The other end of that spectrum um, is that it's all coming down to Pennsylvania and there is a knockdown drag out fight going on with objections, wholesale objections to absentee ballots, and the system is really bogged down under the Pennsylvania rules in trying to get ballots uh, counted because of, of legal challenges. 
So we don't know how crucial Pennsylvania is going to be, uh, but clearly the election officials in that state uh, understand that uh, they're going to have to take extra efforts uh, to get it done as, as quickly as possible and meet those electoral college deadlines so that there are no questions about Pennsylvania's votes. As I think everyone knows, even if you don't meet the safe harbor, there's still a second deadline. Uh, even if the votes are not in by then, it doesn't mean that they won't eventually be recognized by Congress. Uh, but clearly any state would like to uh, meet every electoral college uh, mark and not have any dispute. Thank you, Trevor. Okay, moving on. Um, what is your impression of how often provisional ballots become included in the vote count? One thing that I found really interesting in looking at this data is that it varies dramatically in a way that is troubling, frankly. Um, so, you know, there are a lot of different factors that go into this. Um, some states use provisional ballots a lot more than other states. Um, and so that's one of the factors. So um, a lot of states do a lot of work on the front end to try not to have voters have to vote a lot of provisional ballots. Um, it depends on how they resolve voter challenges on the front end, et cetera. Um, so part of this is just a question of what, how, how big a category of voters are getting pushed into the provisional ballot status. Some some states are only, the only people who are casting provisional ballots are people who probably aren't eligible. Um, and in other states, you have a lot of people ca casting provisional ballots that probably are eligible. So it's hard to say um, much definitively on a nationwide scale. You can look, um, the Election Assistance Commission does have data on provisional ballots, ballot acceptance rates, and you'll see some states with you know 90% plus rates and other states with like 20% rates um, and, and differences by county, et cetera. I think some of that is explained in a um, kind of non-problematic way by what I've, I've said about differences in how provisional ballots are used. Um, but I think some of it also um, might be uh, troubling um, as you drill down and see some places that are kind of highly aggressive in rejecting provisional ballots. Um, so not a very satisfying answer. It, it varies dramatically uh, from state to state. Um, I don't know if Brian or Selena have anything to add to that. I was just going to add to your point, Daniel, that the, uh, the, the New Jersey law supervisor the same notice and cure as the provisional ballot, which is, which, is a, which is a great feature of the law through then and now, the law now. Yeah, I, I don't want to put a wrinkle, <laughs> but wrinkle is what I'm going to do. So um, one of the questions that have been coming that has been coming from our field is whether or not you know, with the mail-in ballots or so many people exercising absentee ballot, if they change their mind and then want to vote in person, is this going to cause a wrinkle um, in the provisional ballot process? Or, you know, because some people aren't comfortable casting a provisional ballot. Um, they want to, you know, there's questions about how that will work and reconcile itself. So I don't know if someone on this call has that answer, but we're still exploring the impact that might have. I think that's one of those examples where you would expect most of those to be counted, unlike other provisional ballots that maybe arise out of the scenario where somebody um, isn't on the voter registration list, right? Um, and you might expect that a lot of those are going to end up being that person wasn't properly registered and they'll be rejected. If people are voting provisionally because they received a ballot or were supposed to have received a ballot but didn't or for whatever reason have chosen to vote in person, those are folks that you would expect to have a very high rate of acceptance. Um, but yeah, we'll have to see how, I, it's a very local issue, I think. Um, but the good yeah. news is that there's a lot of people paying attention, um, especially uh, the league in the state. Thank you all. Okay, so we'll take our next question. Um, to, the, to the panel, please talk about the roles of and restrictions on quote unquote poll watchers. 
So I would just briefly note that uh, that's a pretty broad term and people use it differently. Uh, the the uh, legal answer to that is that there are individuals who are authorized under state election laws to be present in the polling location. Some of those are the election officials. Some of those are observers who have been designated by political parties, uh, have been accepted by the state, and have credentials to be in the polling place. This would apply to election day itself, to the in-person balloting. Uh, it also will apply to observing vote counting and the transmission of tallies. Uh, that is all done in a very transparent way but it is done with a limited number of people who are authorized observers and have credentials to do so. Uh, polling places are often small. Uh, it is prohibited by law to engage in electioneering around those or to be present in them if you are not an official or waiting to vote. So, the other looser definition uh, that's been used by some of the candidates of uh, poll watchers, which suggests that individual citizens can uh, turn up at polling places and uh, gain entry or be outside of them uh, in some way to prevent fraud. All of that is very different and not provided for by law. And indeed, as we discussed earlier, may run afoul of some provisions of law uh, if they are in any way impeding voters, asking voters questions, preventing them from getting to the polls, et cetera. So two types, one, the legally credentialed observers, including from every uh, party who has produced an observer, versus uh, the, this idea of unauthorized individuals playing some role in actual polling places, which is not permitted. Thank you very much, Trevor. So, so we're going to take one more question, and then um, I'll open it up to the panel for some closing thoughts. Um, so the, quest the, the questioner asks, what entity is responsible for ensuring a peaceful transfer of power after the presidential election? Trevor, you look like you might have some thoughts on that. I, I do, because the, the system is pretty clear. The Electoral College uh, votes, and then the Congress of the United States counts those votes, and assuming there is a majority in the Electoral College, they uh, recognize that majority and certify that person as the winner. This is all done in public. Uh, so it's the Electoral College followed by uh, the Congress. Uh, there is no formal role, uh, any role at all, for courts unless there is a dispute about counting ballots, as there was in 2000 in Florida, um, or if there is an uh, allegation that somehow the Electoral College is not working uh, the way it, uh, following its procedures, or that uh, the House and Senate are not following the law, which is laid out in the Electoral Count Act passed a century ago, that uh, specifies how Congress will proceed if there's a question about counting ballots. But otherwise, uh, Congress is the, the uh, entity that accepts the results of the college and announces them. I'll just add that um, I understand that uh, why the media asks and why it is so troubling to hear um, the President of the United States say anything other than a total commitment to a peaceful transition of power. Uh, that being said, the only power that President Trump has in this country is the power that we gave him four years ago by electing him President of the United States. On January 20th, if he is not elected president again, if he's not reelected, he becomes a private citizen with no power because the power it, that he has right now is only the power that we gave him through our democracy. And, and so um, it is, of course, not ideal um, to be in such a scenario, um, but he does not hold the power to determine um, how our transitions of power uh, proceed. We do. Thank you.
Got it. Um, before we turn to closing thoughts, there there is one more question that came in um, that we want to pose to the panel. Um, and the question is, while state legislatures don't like the outcome, that might not like out the outcome, can't propose their own state of, slate of electors, um, what is the prospect of legal action to overcome those constraints? So um, I, I think the, the intention of this question is, you know, what is um, the possibility that uh, the state legislators might prevent a different slate of electors than the apparent outcome of the election itself? I think the best reading uh, of the Constitution and the Electoral Count Act is that um, state, every state legislature in this country has granted the power to select the presidential electors to the voters of those states. And having done so, they are bound by the results of the, the voters casting their ballots. Um, the only place which at this stage is, is speculation, but the speculation about what state legislatures could do arises uh, if there is a credible argument that somehow the voters failed to select a candidate. So you get to the discussions we've been having uh, if there were a close and disputed uh, issue in the counting of ballots and the legislature believed or a majority of the legislature believed that they could not figure out who had won the popular vote in that state, who, who had the, the, um, the plurality. In that circumstance, they could say, well, the election has somehow failed because the voters haven't given us a choice and therefore the power to make the selection of electors reverts to us because the, we don't know what the voters did. Uh, and that's why counting every vote is important, doing so in a timely way is important uh, because clearly the voters have the right to do it and it's important that everything be done to figure out what their decision was in, in every state, because that's the only scenario where the legislature might say, because the voters didn't do their job or we can't figure out what they did, our election officials are unsure of it, we have to do it instead as a, as a backup. And that would lead to the scenarios potentially of uh, conflicting slates of electors out of a state. Uh, if the governor believed that the returns were different than the legislature thought they were, or the governor thought there was an election and, and could certify. So that, that's the, the area that uh, Professor Morgan's question addresses. Great, thanks so much. So we're going to move just to some brief closing remarks if, if you all have them and we'll move um, counter, or we'll move clockwise as I can see you on my screen. Um, Selena, Danielle, Ryan, and then finally Trevor. So Selena, if you want to share some final thoughts before moving on to Danielle, Ryan, and Trevor. Yeah, so first I just want to say thank you for this opportunity. It always gives me an opportunity to nerd out, which uh, is kind of fun to do with colleagues that you work with a lot. And so I appreciate that. But I think um, on behalf of the League of Women Voters, I think it's really important to, to say one, you know, participate early. I think that it's so important to, to participate in this election, but also to participate early, especially if you have concerns about your ballot being effectuated or executed appropriately. And then the other thing is, you know, it's an opportunity to learn a lot about the candidates on our ballot. And I always tell friends and family, vote for the person who represents your values and the values of your community. That's so, so important. We, you know, talking today about reentering citizens and thing and people like that in situations, our vote is more than just us. There are so many people in this country who are disenfranchised or just don't have the opportunity to vote, whether they are returning citizens, whether they're people under 18. And so it's just so important for us to be thinking about our, our vote and our end of our collective vote and not just you know that single act that we do on election day. So thank you so much for having me. I hope that this was helpful for people and I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, I'll just echo a lot of what Selena said. Thank you, um, everybody who has joined and asked really thoughtful questions. It's always really fun for me um, to see that uh, 
the community at large is thinking as hard about these questions um, as we are. Um, you know, election time is fun for us in that way because I spend a lot of the year thinking about these questions. And this is a time when um, everyone in our collective community is. Um, and it's, you know, warms my heart to see folks uh, so invested. Um, and that transitions to my next thought, which is really uh, perhaps um, stealing a bit of what Ryan said in his introduction, which is just reminds you how much our country is focused on voting rights right now um, is really a message about how powerful our vote is. Um, and all of the resources that are being thrown into kind of creating anxiety and stress and chaos, um, it's being done because our vote is so powerful. Um, and uh, the good news is that uh, no one can take that power away from the American people. Um, and uh, we have an infrastructure in place um, and voters have the power. Uh, so it's always important to remember that all of these kind of attacks and the anxiety and stress comes from a place of power with the people. Um, if, if it were not for the fact that our vote was powerful and that we do live in a democracy, we would not be facing these kinds of attacks because it would be easy to just elide the whole issue. Um, but we do, and, um, and we're going to keep it, and we're going to keep it by uh, all of us voting. I, I would end by, by saying thank you, Jason, for leading this conversation, which I think has been really interesting and helpful. And to our partners, uh, what a pleasure to be working with you uh, out in, in uh, uh, all of the, the work we're doing preparing for this election as, as well as on this call. Uh, I, much has been said, so I, I think the only thing I can add is be sure you vote. Remember, you can vote uh, uh, by mail. You can vote in person in most uh, communities. You will have early voting in most communities that you can find an early voting place to go to and cast your ballot if you don't want to wait until election day. Uh, but the important thing is to be sure you cast your ballot uh, because uh, the system is going to ensure that uh, it is accounted for and counted uh, and that we get a result out of this election. That's what we're all working towards. Ryan, any uh, final thoughts? No, I love, so again, thanks for the chance to participate in the conversation. It's, uh, I, I love these conversations and I, I do think about the question that Danielle answered about the transfer of power, which always happens when we exercise our power. That's the purest way to transfer power and we have it. So to your point, Trevor, let's let's use it. Very much. Um, and I, I will share some thoughts on behalf of uh, all of the Campaign Legal Center. Um, the, the cases discussed today will help ensure voters have access to safe and secure voting during the COVID-19 pandemic and are also key to protecting the integrity of the election. Potential issues, including technical ones, must be clarified now so that they don't become fodder for partisan disputes during the heart of the election. And CLC and our partners, um, like those on today's call and many others, are working now to make sure needed policy changes or clarifications are made and publicized as soon as possible so voters know what the rules are and have clear and accurate information. We have a duty as Americans to ensure that every voter can vote safely and that every vote is counted. If you have additional questions after the end of this call or would like more information, please email us at info at campaignlegalcenter.org. Thank you again. Have a good afternoon. And thank you to our speakers and all of you for joining us today.